Uh, last week we're in ex- Exodus chapter 13, and uh, we spent some time talking about uh, this concept of setting aside the firstborn and redeeming the firstborn. And we spent a great deal of time talking about uh, what would happen if you had a, uh, uh, a herd of asses uh, and why you would redeem using a lamb. Uh, or a clean animal to redeem an unclean animal. But if all you had were unclean animals, you'd need to have a clean animal in order to sacrifice to the Lord. You can't have an unclean sacrifice. And so uh, the the entire process of what we see as um, establishing a pattern that when great things happen in our lives, we're to dedicate first fruits to the Lord, we're to remember the Lord in all things. I've told you before that, that part of this issue of the grumbling and complaining that went on with the Israelites, you know, God said, I finally heard their cry. It was because they weren't crying out to him. They were crying out to each other. So really our first line of defense, our first line of, of praise, our first line of concern, we need to lift it up to the Lord first. Okay? The scripture in First Timothy that talks about a man having his house in order, I always take exception to the traditional teaching that means that everybody has to be lined up and everything has to be perfect and, oh, they have to be so wonderful. No, a man's house in order to me means that it's God first. That's a house in order. That's God's order. That's God's economy. God's order is right there established. Here's what he wants. He starts with the first commandment. There shall be no other gods before me. So if that's the case, then he wants to come first. We need to go to God's first. And if we want to keep our houses in order, if we will go to God first. I'm doing a wedding this afternoon. I'm going to tell them if they keep God right in the middle of that marriage, a cord of three strands is not easily broken. So if he's in the marriage, they go to God first before they complain to their husband or before they pray, Lord, you know, please uh, remove this curse from me. Well, what curse are you talking about? Oh, the curse when they said, I now pronounce you man and wife. Okay. Okay. That's not to be a curse, that's to be a blessing. All right. Tell the story all the time about this woman who had this 25 carat diamond ring on her hand. And, and uh, somebody commented and said, that's the most amazing ring that uh, I've ever seen. And they said, what's it called? And they said, oh, it's the, it's the Plotnik diamond. And they said, well, why is it the Plotnik diamond? And they said, they said that it, uh, comes, it comes with a curse. It's named for the curse. And they said, well, what kind of curse? And she said, Mr. Plotnik. <laughs> you didn't like that story, honey? <laughs> oh, yeah, of course I changed it. Okay. Now it's mine. All right. I heard it from somebody. I changed it. Now it's mine. <laughs> That's how it works. Okay. Same thing as a sermon last night. No, no, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> so, so we have this, this uh, dedicating the firstborn. Okay, and this is, a, this is a continuing concept of first fruit, okay? that we take first fruit. Is it a tithe? Well, what, what about the New Covenant Scriptures that talk about God loves a cheerful giver? You shouldn't give out a compulsion. Well, that's exactly right. Okay? And you should support the widows, and you should support the orphans, and you should put it in the storehouse, and you should take care of this. And so 10% tithing is really a break over the 30% tithing that the New Covenant Scriptures call for. So if you're really going to be a complete believer, you take the 10 from the old, the 30 from the new, And I'm thinking 40% is the new 10. All right? So now that I have you all together, I want to let you know that most of you are about 30% short. Okay? And I told you that story that a friend of mine called and said he had a congregate win the lottery for $4 million, and they brought him a check for $400,000 and said, here's my tithe. And he said, should I accept that? And I said, absolutely not. He goes, I completely agree with you. You all gotten gains. And I said, no, the check should be for $1.6 million. He said, 1.6 million, why? I said, 40%. 10% from the old, 30% from the new. Okay? So you should go back to him. He goes, oh, I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> a lot of stories like that. So here we are in a uh, uh, new Torah reading as we begin in Exodus chapter 13, verse 17. And uh, we talked about the fact that we have this annual reading cycle. Okay, and the reading cycle is based on weekly scriptures which are set up uh, based on, and so when we read from the Torah portion, the Haf Torah portion each Friday night, we're reading from a designated portion of the scriptures that says that on a 54-week cycle, 
we're reading the entire Torah. And so the instruction I give is for you to take and take the, the Jewish calendar. We have them available here. Look at the Torah reading and read that reading, and then you'll hear a part of that reading every Friday night. And if you'll do that at the same time that every other Jewish congregation in the world, every other synagogue in the world, Messianic and traditional, are reading from the Torah, imagine what it's like 24 consecutive hours. Because remember, every, every time zone, there's 24 time zones, so every hour okay, you have your Shabbat at a different hour. It may be when it's 7 o'clock in Jerusalem, it's not 7 o'clock here. So let's say just agree that 7 o'clock is sundown. Well, when it's 7 o'clock here, it's 8 o'clock in Atlanta. So at every hour, these readings are going up. Readings are going up. Readings are going up. You have this, this every Jewish and Messianic Jewish synagogue and congregation in the central time zone at the same times, approximately during that hour, are all reading the same scripture. You see how powerful that is when the community comes together in unity. Okay? Well, when we look at the, the, uh, the Bible, the Bible is broken up, the Torah is broken up based on the rabbinical cycle. And there's two different cycles. There's an annual cycle and there's a triennial cycle. And depending on whether or not you're Ashkenaz, which is Eastern European Jewish, or you're Sephardic, which is Spanish Jewish, Spain, Portugal, Morocco, North Africa region, depending on whether or not you use an annual cycle or a triennial cycle. And so we use an annual cycle because I'm Ashkenaz. If I was Sephardic, we would do it differently. It's usually based on what the background of the rabbi is. And so I'm an Ashkenazi, Eastern European Jew, so we go on that cycle. So we subscribe to the annual Torah cycle. It's just a matter of opinion and preference and how you like to do it. There's a lot of things that aren't specifically biblical. The biblical concept is, is that you're to read the Word. You're supposed to do it on a regular daily basis, and this gives you, many of you have an annual Bible or a, a daily Bible, this gives you a weekly reading. And so when you've read all of it in accordance with the weekly readings and you spread it out over seven days, you will have read the Torah once every year, okay, for every year of your life. And so we now get into a new Torah portion, which is called Bishalah. Now, when Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them by way of the land of the Philistines, although it was nearer, for God said the people may have a change of heart when they see war and return to Egypt. So God led the people round about by way of the wilderness at the Sea of Reeds. This would appear like they were wandering lost people okay, to the Egyptians. And I want to tell you a concept. And I guarantee you that uh, if I asked for a raise of hands, every person in this room would have used this term. And I will tell you it's an anti-Semitic term. And I would venture to say that every one of you that's ever said it would say, well, I never knew that. And the term is, oh, I was just moseying around. Well, that's a derogatory slur against Moses and thinking that he was an aimless, this is aimless wandering. I'm just moseying around. What were you doing? Oh, I just, you know, I was moseying around. Okay. Very anti-Semitic, very negative comment, very derogatory towards the Jewish people. When you look at the origin of words, see, many of us use vocabulary. We use expressions all the time, and we have no idea what they mean. I remember singing a song when I was a kid, having no idea that this had to do with either one of the plagues or that it was, right, ring around the rosy, okay? Uh, or, or it had to do with um, slavery, and it was a slave song, or it was a, uh, an ethnically or racially uh, derogatory song. You learn things when you grow up. How many of you said the prayer, and now I lay me down to sleep? Okay. You're four years old, and if you should die before you wake, what, what terror do we strike in our children when we plant the concept that you could die in your sleep? To a little kid. No wonder kids have nightmares. Okay? You think about what we plant in our children. So we need to be aware. God gives us discerning ears. We have these ear gates. If faith comes by hearing, what else comes by hearing? And so we need to be very concerned about what we say and what we hear. And we use things without thinking about it. But now that I make you aware of it, now you have information. Okay? I don't use that term anymore. Did I? I'm sure that a point in my life I did without any understanding. But now that I understand it, I'm not going to use it because I see how it very derogatory is saying that Moses was a nameless wanderer. Okay? He wasn't a nameless wanderer. God, God took him on the path. Okay? And the concept is it took 400 years to get the Jews out of Egypt. It took 40 years to get Egypt out of the Jews.
Very interesting concept. Not an original one by me. Actually, that's quoting an author that I don't remember his name. But by the time you hear it the third time, I will have said it. <laughs> I'm telling you now. Don't say I told you. Don't call it plagiarism when I, when I tell you I'm going to do it three times from now. So now the Israelites went up armed out of the land of Egypt. Where did they get arms? <coughs> they went up armed. One statement, one simple statement. Okay? Now they weren't an army, were they? And if they were an army, would they have not overthrown Pharaoh? They were 600,000 men strong. Even if you have a million men, okay, there's going to be great casualties. Okay? And even in the, the Six-Day War, so what if you were outnumbered 10 times or 100 times? didn't matter when God's hand was on it. Okay? The victory belonged to the Lord. So what difference does it make whether or not they, they were outnumbered? Okay? They weren't armed while they were in Goshen. So how is it that they left armed? Well, they had the Lord on their side. And we know that they were brought silver, they were brought gold, they were brought everything. And people came with them. Right? Nobody went out in the desert unarmed. Right? So this was a concept. If it's getting warm, somebody can hit the um, AC, even if it gets stagnant. Because a lot of people in here will want to get the air moving. And Moses took with him the bones of Joseph, who had exacted an oath from the children of Israel, saying, God will be sure to take notice of you. Then you shall carry up my bones from here with you. Why is this important? Part of the prophecy, but you remember Abraham was willing, very willing to take Isaac up the mountain to sacrifice Isaac because he drew upon the promise in his heart that God had made that he said and spoke. He said, you will have a son, not this one, okay? and his name shall be Isaac, and the inheritance will go through him. Well, if Isaac would have died on Mount Moriah, what would have happened? It would have ended, okay? and God would have been a liar. So Abraham knew in his heart, complete, full of faith, hidden the word of God in his heart, that he had to be willing to do whatever God said in regards to Isaac, because God would either resurrect him or he would spare him or find a substitute for him because out of pure faith and belief in what God had promised. Well, Joseph made them promise. So this was the hope. Now, wheeling a casket around doesn't seem like much hope. It seems like death. But in fact, it was a symbol of life. When we look at the lamb that was slain, it wasn't the life of the lamb that brought redemption to the Jewish people. It was the death of the lamb. It wasn't the life of Messiah it was the death and resurrection of the Messiah. Okay? Certainly his life was important. He had to have lived. But we've been talking about his death and his resurrection for 2,000 years. Okay? Was that not what was important? Okay? The sign of the cross was the sacrifice tree. It was the, it was the altar in which he died. Okay? We look in an empty tomb, so because there's nothing in the tomb, we have no place to represent the death of Messiah. So we continue to look at the cross. A symbol of what? His death it was not a symbol of his life. The cross has never been a symbol of the life of Messiah. It's always been a symbol of the death of Messiah. And out of death, this death, out of the death of the Lamb, we received our release from Egypt. Out of the death of the Lamb of God, we received our release from sin. It is in the death of something. So our hope really winds up being in death. Now, we think of death as morbid, and we think of the loss of life as being grievous, but the truth of the matter is, how many celebrate Martin Luther King Day? Okay. Was it about his birth? Okay. We remember what he did in his life, but we remember him because he's dead. How many know the speech, I had a dream? Okay. He did it in life, but we remember it, we memorialize it because he's now dead. It gives us, it becomes a beacon of hope. In his death, it became forever a part of history. And every time we have a Black History Week or we have any kind of history related to the community and to the, to the freedom that came and to biblical freedom that came because it was a biblically setting free. 
Okay? Speech made in a church. Okay? It was a sermon. Okay? It wasn't just a civil rights statement. It was in a sermon. And because of that, and we can see that this word of God is going out and it's memorialized in a man's death, we can now see the importance of this. Okay? Our hope, okay, we look at that cross and what does it give us? Do we grieve? It gives us hope. It's a symbol of hope. I told you before that on the mountain when Moses stood there and the Amalekites fighting the Amalekites, and when his arms were outstretched, the victory belonged to the Lord. This is what he looked like. This was a symbol of victory. And so the sign that we've perverted into using as a weapon of destruction against the Jewish people is truly a symbol of victory if we will embrace it as such. God gives us this vision right here as we look at the bones, the bone box, the ossuary. Okay, it wasn't a big coffin and, and a, uh, uh, a mummified body. It's a bone box. Okay, it's an ossuary. It's about this big, and the bones fit in the box. But the people saw that this was the hope. They kept the bones. Why did they keep the bones? Because there was a promise made. And that promise always gave them hope, as long as we have the bones. If Pharaoh wanted to disarm the Jewish people and take their hope away, he wouldn't have just enslaved them. He would have taken Joseph's bones away. That was the ray of hope that he said, when you leave this place, take me with you. If I really want to, if I really want to destroy the morale of the people, I'm going to take the bones away. But God supernaturally protected it so that there would be an ensign of hope to go before them. They set out from Sukkot and encamped at Etham at the edge of the wilderness. The Lord went before them in a pillar of cloud by day to guide them along the way in a pillar of fire by night to give them light that they might travel day and night. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not depart from before the people. When we pray, and you ask me to pray for an opportunity, you pray for a situation, I always pray this. May the Lord go before you and prepare the way. So if we look at this relationship of God was out in front and the people followed the Lord. He was a lamp unto their feet and a light unto their feet. This is the whole concept. Look at it. It's visible. Okay? It had to be before them as long as they saw it. And as long as they stayed where he told them. And although he took them on a circuitous route. He did it because he took them away from an encounter with the armies. He wasn't, this wasn't to be a battle. This was to be a victory. And this chapter started out, and this verse started out, when he let the people go, he took them by the way of the land of the Philistines. He did not take them by that way, although it was nearer. He took them, the people round about by way of the wilderness of the Sea of Reeds because ultimately he was leading them into victory, not into defeat. Remember, they were like the, the people coming out of the concentration camp. They were undernourished, overworked. Okay? Although they were armed, they weren't equipped for battle. They weren't trained for battle. And to encounter armies along the way would have just depleted their resources and beat them down further. They were already beaten down. So the Lord had a plan. So in four, chapter 14, the Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites to turn back and encamp before Piharoth between Migdal and the sea, before Baal Zephon, you shall encamp facing it by the sea. Pharaoh will say of the Israelites, they are astray in the land, the wilderness is closed in on them. Then I will stiffen Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them, that I might gain glory through Pharaoh and all his host, and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. And they did so. God already knew what was going to happen. And for now, the 11th time God intervened, where Pharaoh started out with a hard heart. He gave him a glimpse of the plague of the death of the firstborn. Pharaoh's heart and cried out, the people of, of Egypt cried out, a cry that had never been heard before. But now, in his pride, he will come to the end of himself. How many of us have been on the brink of disaster, been saved from disaster, and think, well, everything's going to be okay now, I'll just go back to the way it was? We all get lulled into a false sense of security. All our ways seem right. 
what the Word of God says. All always seem right to man. All ideas are good ideas. But the truth of the matter is they're not good ideas. And unless we read the signs, the road signs that say we're headed to a dead end, believe it. If there's a sign up that says dead end, it's a dead end. There's a cemetery in uh, uh, Georgia that right in front of the cemetery gate, the sign says dead end. I think it's so profound. <laughs> but it's at the end of a dead end street. And somebody in the, in the uh, highway department thought that that was the right place to put a sign that said dead end. So right now you see the sign over the gate, the cemetery, and it says dead end. Uh, you got to read the signs. You got to read the signs. And so people go along, they don't read the signs. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his courtiers had a change of heart about the people and said, what is this we have done releasing Israel from our service? He had already forgotten the death of his own son. This is walking purely by sight. He now becomes logical. He's moved from grief. What have we done? Now we're going to have to do the work. Who's going to do the work? We're never going to get a group as cheaply as we got them. He ordered his chariot and took his men with him. He took 600 of his picked chariots and the rest of the chariots of Egypt with officers and all of them. The Lord stiffened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and, gave, and he gave chase to the Israelites. As the Israelites were departing defiantly, the Egyptians gave chase to them. And all the chariot horses of Pharaoh, his horsemen and his warriors, overtook them in camp by the sea near P. Hahiroth before Baal Zephon. As Pharaoh drew near, the Israelites caught sight of the Egyptians advancing upon them. Greatly frightened, the Israelites cried out to the Lord. Once again, purely by sight. Their reaction is purely by sight. As it seems natural that our reaction would be the same. Regardless of what blessings and promises we have, because each one of us has the same promise. If you're a believer in Messiah, your promise is, is you're going to a place where there is no pain and suffering. You're going to a place where there is no disease. You're going to a place where the streets are lined with gold, and the gold is so clear, it's so pure, that it's transparent, you can't even see your reflection. Well, if you can't see your reflection, whose reflection do you see? You see Yeshua's reflection. Okay? So that means you become pure. Because the only reflection you'll see in the new heaven and the new earth is a reflection of Messiah. But even though we have all these promises, it's pretty easy to get caught up. You get a foreclosure notice. You get a letter in the mail. You get a phone call. You get a diagnosis, and fear sets in. I had a question where it says they were departing defiantly, and the footnote says with upraised hand. Is, is that praising God? Sure, they're le they left and they're just, they're, they're just um, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll hear about the song of Moses, but, you know, just the praise is going out that we're finally free. We get to go, you know, and, and we know that it will change, okay, as people do. How many read stories about what happens uh, to those that win the lottery? They're pretty radical stories. Somebody wins, you know, $100 million and their life is forever changed and never the same, and they are definitely not better off. He died. Or me? I do. With a high hand. So you know that story about the man that for 25 years prayed every day to the Lord that, Lord, today, please, Lord, let me win the lottery. And finally, after 25 years, God spoke to him and said, Abe, meet me halfway, buy a ticket. So as Pharaoh drew near, the Israelites caught sight of the Egyptians advancing upon them. Greatly frightened, the Israelites cried out to the Lord, and they said to Moses, Was it for want of graves in Egypt that you brought us to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us taking us out of Egypt? 
Is this not the very thing we told you in Egypt, saying, Let us be, and we will serve the Egyptians, for it is better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness? But Moses said to the people, Have no fear. Fear not. Okay? We begin to see a pattern of fear not. Okay? And fear not is, is a, a command that's repeated in the Bible many, many times. We'll see that Joshua, okay, there's a great deal of fear nots. Okay? And this is great instruction. We saw a lot of fear nots in Genesis. Again, it's repeated. And it's repeated all throughout the Bible as a direct instruction to us to fear not. Okay? It's easy to become afraid because in the natural, and we're all influenced by natural, okay? lightning, thunderstorms, okay? earthquakes, tremors, uh, all kinds of, of things going on, gunshots being fired, whatever it is, fire, theft, illness, easy to be frightened. But fear is the point man for all the other spirits. And if we keep fear out, we keep depression out. We keep anxiety out. We keep worry out. We keep a spirit of lack out. We keep a spirit of confusion out. All that. So in this congregation, we very much stand against it. We open every service welcoming the Holy Spirit, which means the Holy Spirit comes in everything else has to leave. And I don't know if you've been in a place where week in, week out, there's decency and order. Week in and week out. It's not that you all aren't prophetic and you all don't speak in tongues and you all don't have gifts of all kinds of gifts. But in the house of the Lord, it's done in decency order. It doesn't mean, you know, last night, did you hear Marty Getz? Okay. Singing in tongues. Real tongues. Russian. And while you were singing the English, you were giving the interpretation. That will rock your world if you come from a theological background that says that speaking in tongues isn't biblical. But it's done all the time, every time Wayne leads the service. Okay? If you're taking a look at true speaking in tongues, it's in a foreign language where someone can interpret, okay, where the interpretation is brought. We bring that here at Bethel El, and you really need to think about it from a biblical perspective. That's exactly what's happening. Okay? It doesn't always have to be a prophetic word. Okay? In the case of the Word of God, it's always a prophetic word. So it's a very interesting dynamic when you look at the richness of a biblical congregation embracing the full Word of God from Genesis to Revelation. You'll see everything evidenced okay, within one service, all of it evidenced there when you think about the full gifts of the Spirit. It's all evidenced right here at Bethel El. It doesn't have to be out of order in order for it to be evidenced. It doesn't have to be a big fanfare and a big show and a big hoopla and everybody get all wild about it. It can be almost to the point of regular and ordinary. Okay? It's not supposed to be out of order. It's supposed to be all a part of it. We're supposed to embrace it fully in the Spirit of God. God's a gentleman. So it can be done in decency order and fully embraced, and you think nothing of it. Well, isn't that the way it's supposed to be? You're not supposed to think anything of it. It's not supposed to draw attention to this event and some, to be some spectacle. It's to be something that's decent order that's going to minister to somebody that's never been ministered to that way before. And people come out of here who have never been in a Messianic Jewish congregation before and say, wow, that was really different. And if you explain it to them from a gifts of the Spirit perspective, they would be shocked. But the truth of the matter is it ministered to them. And those that didn't know anything about it weren't confused and weren't perplexed. And there was no clanging cymbal and banging drum. Because they understood what was going on. Because it was presented in such a way that it was decent and it was orderly. And it was presented in a way that could minister to them. And isn't that why God gave us those gifts? To use them for Him, not for ourselves, but to use them to glorify Him. And so it's important to see that at work. So here it is that they're walking completely by fear. But Moses said to the people, have no fear. Fear not. Stand by and witness the deliverance which the Lord will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today you will never see again. The Lord will battle for you. You hold your shalom. Now, who is this man? And let's look at the evolution of his character. Over 80 years ago, we read the story of his life as a bold, brash, and unbridled character that needed to be jerked up and sent out into the wilderness as a shepherd to learn humility so that God could use him, to give him a teachable heart and a teachable spirit. Why? So that God could do what we talked about last night, to strip him down of this hard veneer that's on the outside of him that he put on himself, his pride, his, his avarice, his belief in himself, all these things that he was doing on his own without instruction from God. And God had to strip him down to the barest point so that he could what? So he could restore him. And when God restores you, he raises you up to an even greater place. 
And he went from being a brash man who killed, okay, who spoke out of order, who had false humility, to a man that's now fully a prophet. And no longer is he saying, thus says the Lord, because now he's so plugged in, he's now tuned in, not only just doing the will of God, but he's speaking the will of God. He's giving comfort, and he's truly stepped into his leadership. Eighty years prior, he wasn't capable of being a leader. But God will groom you, and God will refine you. And once again, God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. And because he chose Moses, Moses didn't choose him. And we resist these things in the natural. We fight against them when God gives us a rebuke, when he gives us a correction. But the Word of God in Hebrews tells us that no father who loves his son spares him from a rebuke. He does it because he loves him. And so when you receive correction, it's because you're loved. God bless you. It's because you're loved, not because somebody's angry with you. It's because you're loved to make you a better leader, to refine you, to get rid of all those weeds. Anybody in agriculture, where's Paul Hendricks? Is he here this morning? Paul's not here this morning. Paul's our, our resident agricultural guy. Well, uh, Derek, you're going to have to step in. When you want to clear a field of, field of weeds, what do you do? You burn it. Okay? If you really want to put it back into the soil, you want to purify the soil, and you want to get rid of the pests, the insects at the same time, okay? and any disease. Okay, You can spray, but you'll kill the weeds, but any disease will still be left in the soil. So the way you kill disease, mold, mildew, spores, anything like that, uh, nests, spiders, weevils, any of those things, the way you clear that field is you burn it. Okay? You cut it down to its stubble, and you burn it. Okay? Well, you burn off the weeds, you burn off the dross, you burn off the pride, you burn off all these things. Okay? And those things you burned off become what? They become nutrients. Okay? When I lose my pride okay, and I understand God's economy and I want to line up in His will, He'll use that pride as a nutrient okay? because we're overcomers by what? The word of our testimony. Let me tell you how I used to be. But then God got a hold of me and He changed this in me. Okay? He changed this in me. It becomes a nutrient going back into the soil, going back into our spirit, going back into our lives. We may draw upon that experience because if we don't look back, not to tell people how horrible we are and we were a troll living under a bridge and we were doing the things that we were doing, but to reference the fact that, yes, I did have a past. Once I was lost, but now I'm saved. Okay? Doesn't that, I don't want to give you details. Okay? And I don't want you giving anybody details. They don't need to know your details. They don't need to know your junk. Okay? It's safe to assume you all have junk. Okay? You all have baggage. Every one of us does. But here's what God's done since I've come into right relationship with Him. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Anyone who's a Messiah is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Let's talk about the new. Okay? But we need, to be, we need to remember that we were old at one time because God's gotten a hold of us and done something. Well, that's the nutrient that goes into keeping us going, that goes into taking us to greater places. And so look what Moses has evolved into. And we've got to look at the character of Moses, where he began. We think Moses was a great prophet, but he started out just like all of us, prideful, full of himself, speaking out of turn, doing things out of order, not lining up to what God that perfect will. He was certainly in God's permissive will. What God allows and what God blesses are two completely different things. And if you want to be in a place where God allows it, you're probably there. But if you're not bearing the greatest amount of fruit, okay, God's going to continue to prune you and work with you until you bear more fruit. If you're not bearing fruit at all, God's going to jerk you up and take you out of the sin because if you're not bearing fruit, you're in some kind of sin. It's just that simple. Okay? God doesn't plant bad trees. So if you're a good tree and you're not bearing fruit, God's going to get a hold of you and circumstances will come into your life to get your attention, to take you out of that sin, to bring you into a place where you can bear fruit for him. So he's either going to discipline you or he's going to prune you. And you have to learn what the difference is because they both feel the same. They both feel the same. They both hurt. Okay? You can stand there all day long talking to your, to your rose bush and saying, look, I'm just going to prune you. I'm not going to kill you. I'm just going to prune you. I know this is going to hurt, but I'm just going to prune you. Okay? I'm not going to kill you. You're not going to die. I know it's going to feel like you're going to die. Okay? But that's how we feel. Okay? God takes these little lopping shears and he cuts off one of our limbs. Okay? It's so that we'll grow new fruit. 
Okay? Because if we were left to grow wild, what would happen? We would stop bearing fruit. We'd become overgrown, and overgrown plants don't bear fruit anymore. So it's important that we understand this process. And this is the perfect example. Moses is one of the best examples we have in the Word of God of discipline and pruning. And we see how that concept works. And now he's able to stand boldly before the people. How many people? Anywhere between one and 600,000 men right, are talking to him. So we know that he's got the command of the language now. He's no longer slow of speech. Oh, me, I'm so slow of speech. I don't know what to say. I don't know how to talk to people.